Hi, everyone. I'm Veronica Vargas Stidvent, Executive Director of the Center for Women in Law. Welcome to today's installment of the Susan Blount Power Lunch series. Uh, today is a conversation with Regina Jones. Um, our Power Lunch series highlights the career paths uh, and uh, uh, roles of prominent figures and lawyers in an informal environment. And today's event has been approved for one hour of CLE ethics credit by the Texas State Bar. If you're watching us in Zoom, you'll receive an email after this session with information on how to claim that credit. If you are joining us by phone, um, you'll want to send us an email at Center for Women in Law, that's all one word, Center for Women in Law, at law.utexas.edu, and we will email you that information. We'll save some time for Q&A at the end, so please feel free to post your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. Uh, the Center for Women in Law is a national resource and champion for women lawyers, generating lasting change within the legal profession. And we do that in a variety of ways through a variety of programs, including programs like today's Power Lunch series, which is sponsored by the Hortense Ward Speakers Fund. We're very grateful for that support and for supporters like so many of you. Gifts of any amount support the many programs and initiatives of the Center for Women in Law and advance our mission. And so we're very, very grateful for your support and generosity. So let's jump right in and meet our Power Lunch guest, Regina Jones. Regina Jones is Senior Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary of ADM, and a member of the company's Executive Council. In this role, she oversees ADM's global legal and regulatory affairs, compliance initiatives, security operations, and government relations efforts. Jones joined ADM in September 2023. Before that, she served as the Chief Legal Officer of Baker Hughes, a global leader in the energy technology sector. For the last three decades, Jones has held domestic and international legal roles with responsibility for complex legal environments across the United States, Europe, Southeast Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East, with expatriate assignments in Paris, France, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Jones previously served as Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary for Delic U.S. Holdings, Inc. and Delic Logistics Partners, LP. Her career includes varied senior leadership roles in legal, supply chain, and information technology with Schlumberger Dynagy Marketing and Trade, Shell Oil Company, and El Paso Energy. She currently serves as a member of the Board of Directors for South Texas College of Law and has previously served on boards of directors for the Houston March of Dimes, Girl Set Gouts of San Jacinto Council, Child Advocates, and the State Bar of Texas. She earned her Bachelor of Business Business Administration General Business from Sam Houston State University and her JD from South Texas College of Law with an emphasis in computer and technology law. So a great career. Regina, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we've gotten lots of questions from the audience already. I think we're going to have a bunch more. But I wanted to just start with, you've been an in-house counsel for a long time now. How did you, uh, how did you get there? Um, how did you position yourself for an in-house uh, counsel role? So first of all, thank you for having me. And thank you to Hortense Ward Speaker Fund for sponsoring today's event as well. Um, and also thank you for calling me prominent. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Oh, I didn't know I was prominent. <laughs> um, with that said, you know, I think my journey if you will, to general counsel has been one that is uh, marked with hard work and luck and a lot of people supporting me in the background. I started off my career in IT, so I spent uh, 10 years in information technology before even becoming um, a lawyer. I went to law school at night at South Texas and then pivoted to, because I was already working in corporate America, I started my legal career in corporate America and merged uh, the two fields, if you will, with the intersection of technology. I began focusing mostly on law, legal issues that related to technology. And that was a time, because I'm old, where we were just starting things like email and local area networks. And so now figuring out how we were going to manage things like data and email, which was just a new concept, I ended up having a skill set that was very complementary to that with my IT background. 
I worked in corporate, you called off the company, so I won't go through them again, but I'll say when I developed the desire to become a general counsel of a publicly traded company, I started looking at career paths of people that I respected that were already in the role. And I looked at and calculated, because I'm a bit anal retentive, just kind of what is the time that it took for them to get there? And I kind of set a clock for myself to say, well, on average, for the roles I had looked at, it was between seven to eight years. So I kind of said, if I'm not there by eight years, then I'm not going to make it. And plus, I would have been older as well, because I didn't, as as I mentioned, I, I was working for 10 years before I even started becoming a lawyer or before I even became a lawyer. So I kind of went on a path and Slumberjay played a big role in helping to really train me in many of the areas that I would then benefit from as a general counsel. So I worked with Slumberjay for 13 years and I worked in international roles as well as I worked in the various legal disciplines, whether they be contracts, compliance, regulatory, et cetera. And so all of those things combined together really positioned me well to be able to pivot into a GC role with being prepared for what lied ahead, if you will. And because of the various um, degrees of complexity that came with those various corporate jobs, it helped me to be able to understand the nuances of the business side in addition to the legal side. So that's where the hard work came in. And then the luck was just because I've had opportunities where people have known me and reached out to me and I was just lucky to get my first GC job. And since then, there's a combination of still hard work, luck, and um, mentors that look out. And you you mentioned coming through the corporate systems, really starting in the business. And so I would posit that gives you a leg up in terms of understanding the business, which sometimes can be a stumbling block, um, particularly for new in-house counsel to understand business interests and how they coincide and sometimes collide with um, legal issues and interests. So I would be interested in your perspective on, on how you really navigate that and how as a, as a, as a general counsel, you are, your client is the company and how you really think about the business interests, the business goals, and then help people understand where they intersect or where they bump up against uh, legal uh, responsibilities or issues and things like that. How do you do that? And and did your background have coming through that, having that corporate um, and business side experience already, did that help you? So that's a great question. And the reason why is because if I had to rank now what skills make me successful in the role that I'm in, I'd first start with the business skills and experience. Then I go to the technology and then I go to the law and then the relational will be wrapped around all of that. Because as I moved up in my career, what I found is that the technical legal understanding and skills took kind of a, they were less prior, they were prioritized at a much lower level than just being able to engage with people at a senior level on real legal and business issues. I always say our job as lawyers is to provide legal solutions to business problems. Of course, there are some areas where you absolutely have to say, no, we can't do this. But in most of them, there's an opportunity for us to look for, you know, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And now how do I deliver a solution that the business will not only appreciate, but will deliver value, will, you know, and even you think about risk, it's not just about what's the risk and how do we avoid it? It's about how do I look at the strategy of the company and ensure that the actions I'm taking are helping to prevent disruption to that strategy. That means you're looking at risk. That means you're helping to educate and influence the business leaders so they can self-police themselves, so they can spot the risk and bring them and now identify when they need counsel. So it's that collaboration, it's the partnership, it's the trust that's built through all of those things. And then you add the technology piece where I'm able to leverage technology to be more productive and efficient. And now at a time when technology is so fundamentally critical, it really helps to influence now how you look at technology alternatives in the legal function and how we can drive efficiency and effectiveness. And in parallel, tackle the le- the legal risks that are associated with the effective deployment of technology solutions. 
So that view of a, of a partnership um, with your business, um, right. that I think can sometimes be challenging, especially for a new in-house counsel who may have come from a very different background. So when you're building your team and, and leading your team, how do you convey that? And how do you make sure that everyone's on the same page about being that partner and not being the no shop necessarily and not and 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 to help the legal department not be seen as just a transaction cost or a block on on business goals. So how do you get your team on the same page on that? I don't know that I have the answer to the question I have. There are practices that we follow and I will say when you're in-house and when you're working in a company, your internal client is going to help you understand that pretty quickly. Because if you show up being the lawyer in the room and that I just want to deliver now the answer to questions, i.e., can we do this? Can we not do this? It it doesn't really provide the solution that we're looking for. You have to come in understanding what's the output, what's the problem we're trying to solve, how do I step into their shoes for a moment because you're going to get the, you're going to have to get them to step into yours as well. So it's recognizing that your role is not to take the decision. Your role is to advise the business on what's the right outcome for the business. You represent the company, which means that you you you've got to understand it's a long game first of all, even with ADM. ADM has been around for over 100 years. So I'm not just going to come in and say we can't do this and we can't do that and the law says because as we know now, even the existential risks that we're dealing with and the challenges of today, some of which there's no real law to say this is right or wrong. So the value of thinking independently and innovation and in now leveraging the legal expertise you have and applying that to that real world business solution, it is an art, but it's fundamentally important. So in working with the lawyers that I work with and the legal professionals that I have on the team, it really is about helping them understand the mindset that's required to deliver value to the business in a way that it also contemplates, anticipates, and comply with the legal and business risk, but also complies with the law full stop and drives the culture of integrity. So Regina, in addition to being partner for the business, and in addition to being that legal advisor, a general mm -hmm. counsel has a lot of roles to fill. You're leading the legal department. Um, you're a member of the organization C-suite. You can serve as a corporate secretary. The list kind of goes on and on. Um, you give the last word on legal issues. So when you think about the role of general counsel, um, and you've you've had the opportunity to serve with different organizations and really think about this, I think, in terms of the prioritization of those different roles, how do you manage those? Do they conflict with each other? And how do you really think about are you wearing different hats at the same time or are you changing those hats? So I don't know how to manage them. Yes, it's difficult. And yes, I'm always wearing different hats at the same time. And prioritization is something I haven't completely figured out because in my world, you can't plan for what's going to happen on a given day. You can flag what you're going to focus on, but there's going to, the real world issues are going to present themselves to you in, in a way that people look at you now as, you know, when you think about the crisis that has happened and occurred over the last three years, you know, just the various levels of it, if you will, people look to the general counsel to tell them what to do. It's not just advise on the law. It's to say, how do we deal with the pandemic? How do I deal with the blockage in the Red Sea when now I've got to go? So in ADM, we work with food. And so if we can't follow the Red Sea route and have to go another 60 days around to deliver at our location, aren't this food's going to spoil? And so it's just now, how do I take, how do I help the business navigate through the various risks so that we can get to the right outcome and the right solution. So prioritization is really going to be based on what's the risk and what's the threat that we're trying to avoid or tackle. And that's going to then help us determine, well, where do I need to start? And then right when you start doing that, someone's going to walk in with a new one. And it's, you don't have the ability to really 
plan, like I mentioned earlier, but all of that experience and expertise until you've had uh, that you've had up until the point you get in the job, it helps you do the one thing that's the most important, which is help take the decision. What do you think is right in that moment? I got a call from a board member today because he wanted to, um, we were looking at something with scheduling one of our board meetings and actually structuring it. And he was asking me about what the way to, the best way to handle it from a governance perspective. And it sounds simple, like you could just say, well, under the securities laws, you're supposed to do X, Y, Z. Well, no, it's not that simple. It's There are three different options. So in this moment, what is the appropriate option for us to take, given what lies ahead, given the situation we're in in the current state, and now given your role as lead director? Let's work through that together. But he's looking to me for the guidance right now. I can't go look it up. I can't go call an associate. I've got to dig in and think about all the experience I've had. So that combination of you prioritize in the moment, you trust your instinct and your gut, because it's you're the smartest person in the room when it comes to now, how do I navigate some of these challenging legal issues? And then you help make sure that to the extent a different risk presents itself, that you advise on that one as well. So um, it's not simple, but it's highly important. And as you're, as you're trying to work those things through in the moment, do you think that heightens sometimes the ethical challenges or the the legal challenges that a, a GC faces because you are in a unique role where you're not just a legal advisor and you have you really are balancing a lot of interests. So what are the big ethical um issues that face GCs as they as they do wear all these hats? So, you know, ethics is an interesting word because um in <clears throat> the corporate context Recently, I tried to latch onto the term integrity because it's all about making good decisions at the end of the day. And those decisions need to be grounded in what's ethical, what's appropriate, what's compliant, what's legal, what's the right thing to do when there's not clarity in all of those areas. And it needs to be aligned with the long-term company objectives and meeting the interests of the various people in your, or people or entities in your ecosystem, whether it be clients, customers, suppliers, et cetera. So I say all of that to say, you know, it's hard when you have to take all of that into consideration. But at the end of the day, it really is about now, how do I manage and address the risk in the right way? And how am I making sure that as we make decisions, they're the right ones. Because sometimes ethics can be about laws and rules. Sometimes it can be about morals. Sometimes it can be about the values that the company holds. Sometimes they can be external as well. When you're talking about, well, what do our clients or our stakeholders expect us to do or our customers or our suppliers? So it's, you know, at the end of the day, there's a degree of ethics in it but I, I try to look at it more so as its integrity that we need to bring to the table and its compliance with the rules, but it's translated in a way that people can understand. I think that's that's really a helpful way to look at it. Um, the other thing that I'm really struck with with your biography, Regina, is that you have such a great background, not only in business, but in technology and supply chain management, all of these things. And so a lot of times when people think about in-house role, they think they really need to specialize in an area of law, and then they're forever locked into that industry. And you are you you really demonstrate that it, there's lots of skills that transfer. You were um, in the energy industry for a long time. Now you're at ADM. So you went from energy, oil, gas to food. Um, but I would just imagine that a lot of those skills transfer and navigating regulatory frameworks may be the same in a lot more ways than people think. So can you talk a little bit about transferable skills, about transcending industries and how you might change from one industry to the other? Because um, lawyers sometimes feel locked in to what they're doing. So that's a great question. I'm actually here in Chicago today in an all day legal meeting where I have a, I say legal, it's my whole team. I always stick to legal, but I have many people on my team that are not lawyers. And um, we're talking about people and how we make sure we're building career paths and we're helping to develop our team to be the professionals, both legal and otherwise, that they need to be for the future. And in thinking about that, 
it's important that we're able to now kind of translate the nuances of the skill sets that are the most important. I've been, you know, I started off by saying I've been lucky. I also am kind of wired to where I always want to make myself uncomfortable. If I'm comfortable, that means I'm bored and it means I'm probably not delivering as much value as I can. So with all of my roles that I've done in the past, whether it be like you mentioned in supply chain or IT or legal and all the legal disciplines I've done, as well as worked in multiple countries in the world, I had kind of done, I felt like everything I could do in the legal space, I'm sorry, energy space. So then you look to now, what are those adjacent industries where I can still have impact, but where I still am grounded in what is a fundamental purpose that I'm trying to serve. In the energy industry and in the legal industry as well, I always wanted to, if I'm in legal, I wanted to help people. I wanted to, to make sure I was delivering value and, and justice in whatever form that looks like. Um, in the energy industry, it was all about, we were providing a fundamental commodity for the world. Now, just being able to turn on a light or being able to generate energy in a meaningful way and also sustainable through the energy transition, that's a powerful purpose. So when I pivoted to the agriculture and food industry, it just, besides the fact that it's very adjacent and there's a lot of intersection, ADM has the largest carbon capture sequestration active field in the United States and one of the largest in the world. And it's been operating for 10 years. We do partnerships with the energy industry all the time when we're looking at now, how can we work together to create a sustainable future? But more importantly, the agriculture industry is actually the largest percentage or has the largest percentage impact on the environment than some of our other partner industries. And so how can we work with them to make sure we reduce that impact? So purpose is a really important part of that as well with that switch. But it, it really, for me, is all about just trying to deliver, um, utilize my expertise in a way that I could have an impact before I got too old. And then I decided I don't want to do it anymore. So to me, the act industry is a great one but because trying to feed the world is a fundamentally important task. And the, um, pop, the, world, the global population is expected by... 2050 to be at 10 billion and yeah i think i got that right for any fact checkers out there but with that said it's going it, to we can't use the same traditional forms of agriculture that we have to deliver the volume of pe to excuse me feed the volume of people that we're going to have to in the future so innovation and partnership but doing it in a sustainable way is really important so that's what led me to make the change to this particular industry and i've had plenty going on for any of, any of those of you that have googled adm in the last 6 months or not 6 3 feels like 6 um, I love that you talked about not only purpose, but about really developing your team and career paths. Mm -hmm. um, the legal profession, as you know, um, has been struggling in recent years with how to bridge that gap to younger generations, um, particularly millennials and Gen Zs who may not um, hold the same values as people um, who came before them in terms of work-life balance, um, what they view as success. And so you have a different perspective on that, coming from corp a corporate environment, working in-house, leading, you know, teams with uh, with multiple functions. So what advice would you give people as they're thinking about developing their teams, whether they're in-house and in law firms in nonprofit or government organizations? What is your advice is, is you've come up and you've had to lead multiple teams, particularly legal teams. How do you think people should be thinking about developing their people, leading teams, and really building that pipeline for the future? I think there's two view, two perspectives. So one is if I'm a member of the team. So if I'm the lawyer, I want to make sure I'm doing the best I can and delivering legal support in a way that it's looked upon as being beneficial to the company or the firm or whoever I'm with. So what do I mean when I say that? 
I think an important part of my ability to be successful has been my um, desire to ensure that I wasn't just making myself look good, but I was making the company look good. I was making my boss look good. I was uh, a person that people could relate to and wanted to have on their team. And sometimes we come in with the mindset that if we're smart and we're good, that's all it takes. Recognizing that there's accountability in all of those places, both as a team member, as a colleague, as a person who has a role to play in the company and in the environment is really important. As a leader, I think it turns to, there's a much higher degree of accountability. I have a team of about close to 500. And on my team, I need to make sure that all of them have a plan and a path for their careers. And that means I need to understand and be able to provide the resources and the platform that they can thrive in their respective roles. They need to understand why are they here and why is it more beneficial for them to make the choice to work for this company versus another company? Because we can't take our teams for granted. Our people are the most fundamental asset when you're in the legal profession. We need lawyers that are going to be the lawyers that we need tomorrow, not just today. So new skill sets, whether it be through AI or whether it be through some form of technology or whether it be leverage, how do we look at data and data privacy or how do we look at things in the context of the various geopolitical risks that we have? Now, my job is to make sure that they're prepared for where they need to be. And I'm hoping that they'll make the choice to continue to work with ADM um, or whatever company I'm with at the time. With And so what that means is that there's a, a partnership, if you will, where I need to both listen and understand and provide those opportunities, while in parallel, they need to show up and deliver and make sure that they're, they're driving value for the company, but also performing at a very high level. Because in the current environment, what we do matters. So if the two are aligned and working together and there's clarity in expectations, clarity and communications, then that means through that partnership, we're able to actually build something together. And that's building a career, it's building a strategy, and it's helping us to move further. The last point I'll make is I have a saying that if you want to go fat, go far, excuse me, go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I like that. And I, I'm trying to think about the challenges people are facing, particularly the intergenerational challenges. So about going far and going together, when you're talking about a multi-generational team, what are the lessons you've learned for bridging those gaps, both in terms of communication and um, and values? And maybe there aren't that, maybe the gap isn't that big, but I'd be curious to see what you found in that space. I think it's simple in that you meet people where they are. All right, but that also means you have to understand now, how they think, um, how they engage. Some people are very direct and they want to, they respect when someone can be direct with them, which is just tell me how it is, shoot it to me straight, make it fast so we can move on. There are other people that actually want to understand because they take meaning in now what they're doing. And so as a result, you have to explain to them the why before they can even get to the how. So that if they understand it now, they're going to run with it and they're going to be all in. There are other people where they may not be convinced and they don't really want to do it, quite frankly. But you've got to help them understand why it's important and why it's the right thing for us, irrespective of the fact that it may not be something that they would adopt. Um, one of a, a, There was a leader that I worked with previously, and she used to say, we may not be in agreement. But when we leave this room, we're all going to be aligned. And so I think it really is just the concept of meet people where they are. Take the time to understand their culture. I used to think that everything evolved, revolved around Americans, meaning the United States, if you will. When I was in the U.S., I wake up, I want to have a meeting at 9 o'clock. Excuse me. Um, I want to have a meeting at 9 o'clock a.m. Well, I'm not even realizing that's 11 p.m. in Kuala Lumpur. And so recognizing that now when I schedule a meeting at 9 a.m., someone, I'm, I'm the only thing standing between them and being able to go to sleep. And so 
being conscientious about now the environments that people are in and the cultures that they're in are really important too. And being open and, and leading with empathy is I think the final thing that I'll say on that. It's important that we as leaders, not just drive because we have power, but drive forward because we do it in a way that we are deliver. we're, excuse me, demonstrating empathy. Do you think you mentioned the crisis of the last three years? Do you think that the pandemic helped or hurt in that regard? Do you think that gave people a little more empathy for what was going on as people really, as we're doing right now, you kind of zoom into people's homes and, and get a better sense of, of where, where they are, as you say? I don't know. <laughs> I think that you could probably look at it both ways. Uh, you know, if I, the last, if I just continue to stick to the last three years, I've seen examples of true care where um, you can see examples of leaders who demonstrate care and empathy and their actions and concern for others. But I've also seen the opposite where we have leaders who lead from places that I don't always understand and to a degree where they're not practicing actively listening or care or um, concern, quite frankly, for the implications um, of some of their behavior. So I, I think it's a balance, if you will. We have grown together in many ways when we have to, when, when things happen. I've seen examples of how now that social purpose resonates and you see examples of people stepping together on issues or coming together on issues like they never have before. But I also see discord and um, lack of leadership in other ways. So I, I'd say it's a balance. So I want to get to, I want to circle back to your role as general counsel and ask a couple more questions on that and then get to your questions from the audience. We've had some submitted so far, and I would encourage everyone um, who's watching live, if you've got questions, go ahead and drop those in the Q&A now so we can get to them before the end of the hour. But I wanted to talk to you about um, how has the in-house legal role changed since, or has it changed since you started, since you sort of took on the legal role uh, in a corporate environment. Have you seen that role change? Are there different expectations now than there were when you first began? So yes, it has changed a lot. Um, being a lawyer in the current environment is hard. And I say that because we're no longer looked at in most instances. And, and, and I just do want to be conscientious that I am speaking from the seat of a general counsel or a chief legal officer. But the reality is that we need to show up now with an understanding of the law, but we need to be able to opine on issues in a way that it's an appreciation of the reality. And I see the same thing when I'm working with outside counsel and with my external law firms. I don't ask them for answers to what does the law say? I need solutions to real life problems. So I need to be able to engage with them in a way where I'm saying, this is what we're trying to do. Not tell me whether I can do it. Tell me how I can do it in, in a way that takes into consideration all the risk that I'm dealing with. That's a different question than used to be asked. And you, you, you combine that with the fact that there's not clarity in a lot of instances, it used to be that laws were more mature and you were you could find an on-point case or you have an issue and you could point to now this is how it's been addressed in the past. You could research it and you could get an associate to now come back and tell me what the thinking is on this and how this case is going to end up. Now it's a crapshoot. You don't know how a case is going to end up. You don't know how a judge is going to rule. You don't know what circuit's going to do what. And that's just in the United States. And many of the issues now involve multiple countries, a, a multiple industries, or multiple issues. And it's just not the same. So having to show up as a business leader and a thinker who can now bring intelligence and acumen and understanding to help guide that's what we're asked to do now. And it takes a completely different mindset to do it. I worry sometimes about law schools, if I'm completely honest, because we teach to the law. That's not helpful to me. 
from where I sit, I do need you to understand the law, but I need you to think now like a professional and like a leader and be able to help make me better because you're sitting around the table, not just to give me advice. I hate legal memos because I don't, besides the fact that people don't have time to read it, I don't want something that, I don't need an answer that you can put on paper. I need an answer you can tell me, meaning I need speed, acceleration of pace. I need to look at it from a global perspective because many of our issues may not, they may be happening in one country, but they may have implications in others. And the mindset and the, the way we think and the way we engage, it's all changing. And it's at a lightning pace and speed and the need to understand technology. Again, I'm just lucky because I had an IT background, but now that's the price of admission. When you show up, you need to understand the law, you need to understand the business, you need to understand the technology and how it, how you can leverage it to be a better lawyer. And you need to be able to relate to people in a way that they respect you and they trust you and they're gonna do what um, you say, quite frankly, and that's hard. I want to get to the outside counsel bit, but you mentioned law schools, and I think that that's a fascinating piece. So if you were Dean Regina Jones, where are there classes? I mean, I think this is really fascinating because um, the law changes really slowly and legal education probably even more slowly. Um, what classes would you introduce to law school or what, what things would you insist that students really focus on or do differently? Um, one of my favorite anecdotes was uh, I taught at uh, the business school for a while and they, uh, my colleagues um, in the business department said that they could always spot the law students, those people who are doing joint degrees, because those were the ones trying to opt out of the group projects. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, didn't, they didn't want the team projects. And so what would you do differently from a legal education perspective? What should, what should we be teaching law students? So my first class would be executive presence, which would be how do you show up in a way that you now automatically show up with a degree of respect and rapport. Well, when you walk in the room, people understand that I wanna hear what this person's talking about, okay? Because they have presence. That is so important because we're giving guidance on issues and people need to respect our advice that we're giving not feel like they can go back and fact check it and get another answer or get a different perspective or second or third an opinion because they can't. So you need them to hear you and you need them to listen to you. That's executive presence. The second thing I would do is teach technology because you need to leverage it and understand it and be able to use it to now extract the maximum amount of productivity and optimization of the work that you're doing, but also to be able to now demonstrate to others when you're engaging with them that you understand something that they too understand, all right, and understand their, their thinking around it. Third is I would also focus on kind of the business mindset, which is how do you think like a business person? Because that will affect how you engage with them, what you talk to them about, what issues you raise, outcome-driven solutions, outcome-driven you know, um, conversations. And then the fourth class I would have, I hadn't gotten to a legal class yet, but the fourth one I would get to is having difficult conversations. Because most of the time, I'm not delivering good news. I'm not telling someone something they want to hear. I'm not, they don't call me when just to tell me how they want to just thank me for all the hard work that I'm doing. They call me because the shit hit the fan and they don't know what to do and they need a quick answer and they my perspective hopefully is valued and they need it fast. So when I show up, I need to be able to think a certain way. I need to be able to engage a certain way. And I need to be able to present a certain way. And in order to be able to do that, it means I have to think like them. Because if I sound like a lawyer, I'm dead. Everybody hates lawyers. All right. That's the reality. When we Nobody wants to, nobody wants to have to invite their lawyer to a meeting. But if they do, you want them to look at you like a business professional. So I engage with 
my peers on their issues, not just on mine. And I'm asking, you know, what is your, what's your business strategy? Help me understand that. Is this the right thing for you to be doing from a business perspective, um, from a shareholder perspective versus just from a legal perspective? So those are probably four areas that I would focus the most. Then when you get to the legal skills, that's just the price of admission. Yeah, you got to know the law. Yeah, you got to pass the bar. But at the end of the day, I could throw a rock and hit a lawyer. Now, how can you bring something more to the equation that's going to be valuable to the company? And that's a good segue to outside counsel. We've got a lot of people on this call in law firms um, wondering how to better serve their clients. And so what do outside counsel do that really works? Um, that how can they be, what do they do that's the most helpful to you in your role? And what are the things that you wish they knew to do differently to be helpful to you in your role? So, you know, this could be a whole lunch session, right? This could go on. I know we could, this, <laughs> this could go on for hours, but. Uh, um, so the law firms I like to work with the most are the ones that are willing to think different. I'm not talking about alternative fee arrangements. I'm talking about thinking differently and being able to solve and deal with issues in a way that is just different. The, the lawyering of the past, which is, I call you if I need something, I pay you by the hour, and you give me a memo or an answer, is so frustrating. The lawyer that shows up thinking about the stuff I hadn't thought about. There are counsel that will come and say, and no, don't add me to the list so that I get the list serves or the updates or the bulletins. Reach out to me and say, have you noticed this? Because this is the next big thing. When you go to your board meeting, you need to be reviewing this with the board because this is the uh, an issue that would affect ADM. Or... Um, we've had these recent cases and based on what I'm seeing, um, I think it's important that you look at or consider now how these could potentially impact your strategy here. The best type of lawyer is the one that's thinking proactively about not just the issue we're dealing with, but the issue that's going to come three issues from now as we deal with this one. And is also thinking proactively when you're not thinking about some of your issues. And I say that because we're going to come to you with the legal work. When the issues rise, when I have a lawsuit, I'm going to find a law firm and I'm going to pick based on whatever the discipline expertise is, who I have a relationship with, what their rate structure looks like, what their success rate looks like, all of those things. That's not going to change. But the one I'm going to call first is the one that I know is going to, it's going to benefit me in the future. I'm going to get a return on that investment beyond the resolution of this matter. They're going to be thinking about this matter and in the context of our strategy. They're going to be thinking about how can they help now provide perspective that's realistic and important from a value standpoint. So it's, and, and then the whole traditional model of billing by the hour. I just hate it because the law prof legal profession is the only one that works that way. So why we think that's the right way to bid, why, why we think that's the right way to price the value that's delivered is just beyond me. But, you know, we'll keep paying the invoices by the hour. But if there was a way for law firms to just think differently, companies do. When we have projects, we don't go say it's going to be 150 hours. So I'm going to call, ch charge you $2,100 an hour for the 150 hours and I'll deliver a solution. No, we have all kinds of models that we deploy to make sure that we are equally aligned on now delivering value for them as well as extracting value for us. So I'd love to see change in the industry. I some days just give up on it, but that's my perspective. I think I would say, keep asking, keep asking for the change. So um, we've got some questions. Some were submitted earlier and I, we've got a few popping up um, in the Q and A, but um, one of the ones was um, what advice do you have for attorneys who are close to partnership, but interested in going in-house? 
uh, go in house unless you <laughs> want to be a partner. And I say that because um, I have a lot of now I spend a lot of time with partners and they're always I'm, I'm just going to be transparent and honest. A lot of times it feels like by being a partner, you have this burden that you're carrying of always trying to get business. All right. Now, some people are entrepreneurial and they thrive in that space. For me, and being in-house, it allows me the ability to thrive on the strategy, the goal, being engaged from the beginning to the end, seeing now the con the continuity of what that collective team can deliver together and being a part of it. And so that's just kind of my thinking on it. Um, another question, as you ascended through your career, how did you make sure that people didn't dim your light or make you question yourself? Um, a couple of things before I answer that, I do, I'm still thinking about the other question too. Okay. I do think it's important to choose what is going to provide you the most satisfaction in the future for yourself. So think about 10 years from now, because if you want to go in house, the best time to do it is a sooner the better because you're positioned to now move into more, you know, bigger leadership roles, unless you're shifting to, um, I'm going to start off being the GC. Um, so follow your passion, do something that just you feel good about because you're going to work your, I hope you, you're going to work your ass off either way. And so it needs to be in, in an environment that you thrive in. Um, I talked to partners who, wouldn't have done anything, done it differently. They love being a partner. And I also talk to partners who get frustrated because they don't like chasing business and they'd like to be in a more stable environment where they can now deliver value in a differentiated way. You work the same amount of time, either one, unfortunately. Um, you just don't get paid uh, by the hour. That's the only difference. Now on dimming, dimming the light, did you finish the question? Um, yes, it was, how, how did you keep people from dimming your light or making you question yourself? Um, I always question myself. There have been times when I've gotten in the roles and even though I know I'm 100% qualified or 150% qualified, you still have that kind of imposter syndrome that shows up like, do they really know that I have no freaking idea what the answer to this question is, but I'm going to, you know, just lean into what I think we need to do here and just, you know, have transparency that I still, you know, reserve the right to come back with a different perspective. Um, but I, there will always be people that are competitive. So that's the way I'd like to frame it is there will be people who want to compete with you for whatever reasons. And there will also be people that just write you off for whatever reasons you need to recognize that that's just going to be the reality. I'm going to show up and there are people who are going to think, I don't know what I'm talking about because I look or act a certain way. There are going to be people who assume that I'm in a different role than I actually am because I look or act a different way. And all of those things are just part of my reality. So I have to just wake up every day, put on my suit, have confidence in myself, have the courage to lead and engage the way that I need to. And then whatever else happens, it is what it is. So that you'll always have that. I've, I've had it my whole career where I have to deal with those things. But I think the word I try to lead with is courage. Because in all of it, you have to have the personal courage and confidence to recognize whatever reality you're in and deal with it in the best way you know how. And typically, the outcome is just fine. So we've got people who want to take your advice and are talking, thinking about building their career and their skill set. And they're asking if you have recommendations for certif certification programs for in-house compliance counsel or books you'd recommend for new sort of a less than five-year tenured in-house counsel? Did you think about career pathways, which I know you're thinking about today in particular, things you'd recommend? Yeah. Right, so I love books. I love, uh, I do audio books all the time. And it's interesting because you can tell that I'm aging <laughs> because the books I read now are like, I'm reading this one book that I highly recommend, but it's only for old, no, it's not for old people, but you do have to, if you're 20, don't read it but it's called Outlived. I don't even know who it's by, but it's basically talking about now how you leverage nutrition and health and wellness to live a healthier life versus a, just a long life. So 
that's not going to help any new lawyers. Um, there are so many. One is this book that I love called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And that's for every period when you're making a transition in your life, because sometimes we forget. We think because we were good at something, that might be what got us the role that we're in. But trust me, that is might not get you to what to the role to the next role you need. Like being a good lawyer got me so far. Being a good person got me so far and being a good leader gets me so far. So what are the skill sets that you need to deliver and 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 ha encompass uh, for I'm saying encompass. I don't think that's the right word. But anyway, what are the possess? What are the skill skill sets that you need to possess to be able to now thrive in the role that you're in today? to be able to get to the role that you want to be in tomorrow. So I loved that book and I love the saying as well, what got you here won't get you there. Outliers is another one because there's small differentiators between good and great, even though that's another book as well, good to great. But Outliers is one that someone gave me very early in my career and I read it twice and it really helped me just understand simple, simple uh, concepts that could have tremendous impacts in just my personal as well as my professional life. So those are a few. I have read this book recently, which is just fascinating, but it's not a career or self-help book. It's called um, The End of the World is Just the Beginning. And I say it's fascinating because it talks about just all of the aspects of our global economic infrastructure and how it was built from the beginning of the of civilization through today and how as you decouple it, everything falls apart. And now what that means to um, both the United States as well as countries around the world in the current environment. You've talked a lot about your experience uh, internationally. Um, and mm -hmm. what are the things that we should be thinking about or learning from a more global perspective? Um, everything, and I say that not to sound like Sarah Palin, I read everything, but um, because every the everything that we deal with that I deal with has a global um, either implication or some aspect to it now. Whereas we used to be a society that could thrive on its own, now. I couldn't understand, uh, excuse me, underscore more the importance of having global perspective and global insight. And that doesn't mean you have to travel the world, but, we, but be well read. Understand what's going on in other countries. Don't just watch CNN, watch um, BBC. Um, pay attention to what's going on in media when they're talking about now what's going on in Asia and what's going in, on in world markets and global trade. Be well read because that's that's so important when you're in now professional business environments that you understand what's going on around you, not just in the United States. And we're um, getting close to time. But I want to give you the last word. We've talked a lot about the past, what got you here, um, uh, tips and advice you've learned along the way. What makes you excited for the future? What what makes you optimistic about tomorrow and next year? Um, instead of we'll, we'll stop our, our retrospective. I want to get your, your future thoughts. Okay. So you made the assumption that I was optimistic. <laughs> maybe that, maybe that's a wrong assumption. So tell no, us. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm an optimist period. Um, and I'm just excited about every day. I'll be honest. I think the things I'm most excited about are technology and just the way that it's um, just the pace and the speed at which technology is changing our lives. Uh, when I can thank, we can thank COVID for a lot of that. But I was in Arizona just a couple of weeks and I had never heard of Waymo, which is self-driving car. So just like you pick an Uber, you can pick a Waymo, which is a car that does not have a driver. It's automated 100%. You know, I think about technology that way. I was listening to something on NPR yesterday and they were talking about how flying cars aren't anything that is now, it's not the Jetsons, it's actually a potential. We look at drones and innovation at, at, at speed and at scale. And so technology is probably what 
inspires me the most and gives me optimism because I'm hoping that whether it be in the medical field or whether it be in um, just our lives and our lifestyle and having the impact on our future. And hopefully through technology, it'll be able to help us with some of the business business and environmental challenges that we're dealing with right now to have a more sustainable future. So are you um, excited or wary about AI? Both. Okay. And All if right. you're not, if you're not excited and wary, then you should be both. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Regina, for joining us today. You've given us a lot to think about. Really appreciate your time. And um, and please thank your team for uh, allowing you uh, to step out of your meeting today to be with us. We really appreciate it. Yes. And thank you as well. Thank you to everyone for listening. I hope that you've gotten just a little nugget out of here that may be able to be beneficial to you. And I wish you all the best. Thank you. And as I mentioned, today's event has been approved for one hour of CLE ethics credit. So um, you will receive, if you're joining us by Zoom, you'll receive an email with how to claim that credit. If you are dialing in, um, please send an email to Center for Women in Law, all one word, at law.utexas.edu, and we'll get you that uh, information. I hope you all will join the Center for Women in Law at future events. Please be sure to follow us on social media and check our website out for more information. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks, Regina. Thanks.